With us now is Mark Langfin, and no, he is not a chef, and this is not cookie dough. It's not a cooking segment, mind you. Mark is here because he has made an, a very significant model of the northern part of Israel, and he's here to tell us about it and why it is so important. Mark, tell us a bit about the model. Well, I wanted to create a visual aid so people can understand the geographic and strategic problems that face Israel in the construction of a durable and lasting peace. Why, aren't there already models that show Israel? Why did you need to make this model? Well, uh, I brought this to the Israeli Foreign Ministry and they do have a topological model now, but the topological model they have is really, uh, while it's the same size of this, it is just, uh, the, it's the entire country of Israel, so you really don't get the flavor of uh, what the terrain looks like and it's almost uh, unintelligible. So this is the first model that actually shows the true topography of Israel? It's never well, been done before? This, uh, there, there are models that have been, ma been made, but they don't really, uh, they're highly exaggerated and you really don't get the true feeling of the terrain and the topography. Now you are a lawyer by trade. Yes, I am. A lawyer and a topographer by evening. No, well, I'm not a topographer <laughs> by evening. I commissioned, uh, I, uh, I'm a Jewish American and I'm concerned about the state of Israel and I commissioned a professional military model maker to make the model and, and he made it. And how long does it take to make something like this? Well it took him a fair amount of time, it took him a couple of months to make it. Alright, let's take a look at it. Maybe you can explain it to us. Okay. Uh, first I'd like to explain, uh, give a little example of the Golan Heights. Now this is the north of Israel and this is the Golan Heights. Now the Golan Heights is really a mountain range and Syria is on the other side and essentially what the Golan Heights does is it acts as a, a wall against a possible Syrian attack against these this area right here. Now this area right here can I borrow the pen? Sure. Thank you. Uh, this area right here is, the, uh, is a major Israeli civilian population which is threatened by a, uh, an attack by Syria into this area. So what this, what this does is it gives you a real feeling for how the Golan Heights protects this area, civilian area, from uh, a Syrian attack. Now many people who are watching this are saying this is very interesting but is this model so important? That I find it hard to believe, as I'm sure many viewers do, that there is not a, a currently a model that is just as accurate as this. Uh, nope. Uh, uh, I've uh, done a lot of research and I've uh, been to the Israeli government on this and they don't have anything as, uh, uh, as accurately depicting uh, the terrain. Right, explain it a bit more for us. Okay, well, uh, the question is always, uh, it is now raised in terms of the Gulf War, in that a, uh, if in the age of missiles, what's the worth of terrain? Well, the Golan Heights is one classic example of how terrain is very important. Because in the Yom Kippur War, what happened is that the Syrians attacked the northern part of Israel. Now, Israel has a very small standing army. And what happened was the Israeli soldiers held off the Syrians uh, by uh, the, by using the Golan Heights to stop the attack. And that gave time to mobilize the, uh, the bulk of Israel's military from the Tel Aviv Netanya area where there are a large number of uh, reservists to go to the Golan Heights to protect, uh, to, to mass the army and to protect against the Syrians. Now in a case of the next war the real lessons of the Scuds are the Scuds are going to be coming over and hitting Tel Aviv as the Syrians are advancing. So what's going to happen is the Scuds are going to essentially kill Israel's ability to mobilize. And what then will happen, can you imagine being a soldier uh, in the Israeli military and you're in your sealed room and then you've just been called off to battle? What do you do? It's a, you can imagine how difficult it would be to mobilize Israel's uh, reserve which it relies on for the bulk of its strength. So this area bides more time? This, a this area bides the time needed to get the soldiers from here to here. 
to defend against the attack. Exactly. What are some other military significances of this? Well, in the West Bank, you can uh, immediately see, no normally, the West Bank is considered, uh, just uh, American, uh, Americans just consider the West Bank as a sort of an amorphous term. But the, uh, the West Bank is really a mountain range. And just like the Golan Heights protects against an attack from Syria, the West Bank is a mountain range that protects against an attack from the east, whoever it may be. And so uh, that is one of the aspects. And on the model, you can actually physically see the uh, terrain. And you can get a feeling for uh, the, the value. What are these red lines? That's the, a very good question. These red lines are the roads that over time have been uh, created. And you can actually see where the roads are from the lay of the land. You can see that there are, this, the, this is the mountain range right here, and there are only a limited number of roads that come up and through this terrain. The importance is that if this area is attacked, a tank can't come up a million different ways. A tank can only come up three or four different ways. And with the three or four different ways, the Israelis know that the tanks can only come up these three or four different ways. And therefore, they can, uh, with a small standing army, which again, it's critical. Israel has a very, very small standing army to, to, to normally uh, hold off an attack till the reserves are able to be mobilized to bring it to uh, a head. Why does Israel have to maintain a security zone in South Lebanon? Excellent question. I'd like. Uh, the, the threats I've just been describing, the strategic threat of war from Syria, the strategic threat from uh, the East, those are strategic war threats. The threat from Lebanon is not a strategic threat. The threat from Lebanon is the terror threat. And the, there are terrorists in South Lebanon who constantly infiltrate into Israel and also fire what's called a, a Katusha rocket. And on the screen there is a, a, a picture of a Katusha rocket. Now, it's very important that you look at this Katusha rocket and understand the power of it. First of all, as you can see, it's a truck and it's highly mobile. Second of all, each of those missiles on the tip, that's a warhead. And essentially, each warhead is 42 pounds. And when you multiply, this Katushas are usually fired in a series of 10, 20, or 30. On this truck, it happens to be 40. But just assuming 30 are fired at one time, a, the scuds that came over to give you a, a, a sense of the power of uh, the Katusha, one scud missile was 300 pounds of warhead. Here, if you multiply 42 pounds times, times each of those warheads times 30 missiles, that's 1,200 pounds of warhead, which equates to four times the strength of one scud. And these things are now being fired into Israel. Now. Mark, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll continue discussing this model of northern Israel. We're going to speak now about airspace around Israel. But first, before we speak about it concerning this model, let's take a look at a clip that we have. The whole of Israel. We are in Tel Aviv. Imagine an aircraft taking off from Damascus in the north or from Mafraq uh, base in Jordan in the east. Minutes flying time from Israel's border. Until it reaches our border, it's anyone's guess whether that aircraft is on a routine mission, on a training flight, or whether it's hostile. We cannot react. But once it crosses our border, a countdown begins. seconds, the capital Jerusalem is under attack. Forty seconds later, Ben Gurion Airport, our lifeline with the outside world. In less than four minutes, Tel Aviv, the coastline, 
These are the hair trigger margins with which we live. Relay what we just saw to the model over here. Okay. What you've just seen is an enemy pilot coming from the east. Uh, and what he did was he flew low. So he came down very close to the ground where it's very hard to see. And then he came up through these crevasses to Jerusalem. And then he swung over from Jerusalem, down the crevasses, and went right over Lod Airport. And then, right from Lod, he went right into Tel Aviv. Now, uh, this brings up an extremely important element of the, of the model, which is the airspace of Israel. Now, when I was in Israel about two years ago, I was lucky enough to hear a, uh, a current Israeli general speak. And he was talking to all of us, and he said, don't be fooled. One thing that there's a consensus on in Israel is in any type of peace agreement, Israel has to maintain absolute air supremacy over the entire West Bank. And he was a current general. So what I've done is I've created a simple graphic illustration uh, which communicates the power of airspace, uh, of uh, the airspace being if Israel had the airspace or if Israel didn't have the airspace. Now what I do to uh, show this... Stole your little brother's I have plane. My, stole <laughs> my, my little brother's planes. Now, assuming... Uh, the best way to understand is at the moment Israel has this airspace over here. So as was just shown on the, the, um, the clip, an attacking plane would be coming from the east. Now right now Israel has air bases. Uh, some of its major air bases are right in this northern area here. So if there's an attack from the east, what happens is Israel is able to um, have a plane come up and the battle would be over the West Bank. Uh, Israel would be able to intercept the plane over the West Bank. But, and therefore stop it before it gets to Tel Aviv mm -hmm. and Lod and Jerusalem and Netanya and this whole segment here which this segment from right here to right here represents 70% of Israel's population. This is the crown jewel of Israel right in this area right here. Uh, so remember, with the airspace, Israel is able to meet a fighter over the West Bank, not terribly far, but far enough away from Israel's civilian population centers. But Mark, with modern technology, modern weaponry, the way it is, is all of this strategic planning a waste of time? Uh, <laughs> I, wanted to show, I wanted to show you what the airspace of Israel would be without it, and then you could make up right. your mind whether it's a waste of time. This is what the airspace of Israel would look like after you take the airspace of Israel out. Uh, you take the airspace of the West Bank out. All of a sudden, you've bifurcated Israel's air bases here from Israel's population centers here. So an attacking plane uh, would have a much, much more easy time to attack because Israel's plane could not go into the West Bank to meet an attack. You've gone into sovereign airspace. Uh, are you going to have Hanan Ashrawi in the UN complaining that Israel uh, violated her air, uh, the Palestinian airspace? Or even yet, and it brings home the exact question you just asked, with technology the way it is today. With technology the way it is today, there would be an air defense system here which would make this look like a, a Sunday lunch compared to what Israel would really have to face. With modern technology and modern anti-aircraft weapons the way they are, this would even be uh, more gruesome to a, uh, an Israeli pilot trying to fend off an attack from the east. So uh, the technology... Uh, Mark, we have about a minute left. I'm sure that many viewers are saying this is a great model, but where did you get all your information? Because you are quite sure about all the information that you're telling us. You're very question. sure in everything you're saying. Excellent question. Everything I have shown you so far, I have brought to the Israeli government, and they, uh, I'm not saying they've approved it, but they certainly didn't say it was wrong. I showed uh, senior defense... Uh, Israeli defense officials. They have, in fact, said, uh, I'm not going to give names, but they have said that my airspace curtain is accurate. And I would love to have someone come and dispute 
these simple um, graphic illustrations. So call on schmoozing and you can dispute with Mark if you'd like. Mark, thanks for joining us. Mark Langfin.